Hello, everyone. I'm so glad that I can be with you today and to share my experience on uh, transformational leadership and uh, business turnaround. I'm going to share with you my own story and some of the experiences that I've had, and hopefully some of them will resonate with you and you can learn from some of the insights. I'm going to take you through uh, step by step, but before I do that, I want to introduce myself, a little bit about myself, where I come from. This is a kind of long house that I was born and bred in, in the jungle of Borneo. If you still go there, you might still have some of these type of long houses. Next photograph is the, uh, it's my father, the guy on your light, uh, left. And uh, he looked like that and uh, he, you know, he, uh, he is no longer here, he passed on. Uh, but uh, if you see the photograph on your right, you look very closely at the photograph, you see some human skulls. My great ancestors, their hobby in life was to go to someone's long house, chop people's hand and take their skull as trophy. They were actually headhunters. And so I come from a lineage uh, of headhunters many, many years ago. But I'm okay, by the way, we don't do that over here. Next slide, please. And I want to take you through on a very serious note, the six secrets of transformational leadership and business turnaround. I'm going to take you through one by one, all of these secrets and hopefully uh, some of them will resonate and be useful to, uh, to you. The first secret is the game of the impossible. If you want to do transformation, transformation means really big change, not small incremental change, very big change. The first thing you have to do is to pursue the game of the impossible. I've been very fortunate to have met all the people in this photograph. You see uh, Richard Branson, Jack Ma, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Carl Lewis. Every single one of them, when I met them, all of them share the same secret, that they pursue what is seemingly impossible. The idea of doing an impossibility is to set a target that you yourself say you cannot achieve. And because you say you cannot achieve it, it will force you to look for a new way of thinking, a new way of doing things, and a new way of chasing and achieving your target, not the old way of doing it. That's how transformation begins with you. But of course, when you set up an impossible target, when you tell your boss that you're chasing an impossible target, you will be very afraid to fail. And so therefore, when you go through this game of the impossible, you have to conquer the fear of failure. And when you set a big target, it means this target goal is going to consume you. It's going to be so large, it's going to occupy everything you're trying to do in your life. Next. And I also had the privilege to have met Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt is a, if you look at him on television, he looks like a very boisterous guy, you know, he's an extrovert. He's a quiet chap, very shy individual. Actually. I was very surprised to have met him. But you know, when, when I met him and I asked him about the secret of success, he also talked about setting Olympic study. He was very clear in his mind that he was going to break all the Olympics record. And so, therefore, if you want to be champion, in what you do, and you want to be very good in what you do, you cannot set small targets. You have to begin by setting very, very big targets. Next slide, please. And I was, and you know, some of you may know, I'm a big fan of Chelsea Football Club. And some of you, I know you are Liverpool, some of you are Menu fans, etc. Some, some are Manchester United. My sister's Manchester United fan. And I was, based in London. I was working in London Shell for four years it was. My son studied at Parkside School. Next to the school, next to the playground of the school is a Chelsea football, football club training ground. And so when I sent my boys to school, I could, you know, literally could see Lampard, Didier Drogba, they were all there. And so I really became a very serious fan of uh, 
uh, Chelsea Football Club. And I thought to myself, I will not come back to Malaysia. I will stay put in London and I will retire there and I wouldn't come back here. Unfortunately, one, one Monday morning, I was called by my boss. He said, Idris, I want you to go back to Malaysia. And we have a shell company in Malaysia. It has a factory in, our, in, in Bintulu. We have a plant in Bintulu and that produce gas to liquids uh, product. But we've been losing money for 10 years. We don't know what to do with it. I want you to go back there and try and fix it. If you can, cannot fix it, then you tell us we will close the plant. We had lost 1.5 billion ringgit over 10 year period. Not a single year in the 10 year period of the company did we make money. We even had an explosion. We lost production for three years. So we had huge debt. The company borrowed a lot of money and we were unable to pay. 75% of our revenue was to pay the debt. And so uh, that was why it was a problem. Next, next slide, please. So when I turn up in the job, I, uh, I normally, when I get into a new job, I will call the staff together. And I remember 1st of June, 2003, I turn up in, uh, in the office. And I told them, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go for the game of the impossible. We're going to make money here. We'll make a profit here in the next six months. And there was one, Dutchman that put up his hand. Uh, Mr. Jala, you'll never make a profit here. We lost money for 10 straight years. And if you make a profit, I'm going to uh, bet with you. I'll give you 100 ringgit if you can make a profit. You know, Dutch people, they don't make very big bets. So I took his wager and we had that bet. To be very honest with you, to be frank with you, by the end of that year, that by, by Christmas of 2003, that means six months from the day I arrived there, we achieved again the impossible. We actually made 10 million net profit after tax. I remember Apple had just produced at that time, iPod. iPod was an object of desire. And I, I remember going to the, the, the Apple store and I bought practically every one of the units that was on sale. Because I had 300 staff, 300 over staff, and I bought all the units that was available in the iPod because I wanted to give them to every staff. So every staff received one because it was the object of desire. Everybody wanted to have an iPod at that time. I wanted to send a signal to everybody that we have won. It's just winning the Premier League. And so everybody was jubilant, so excited. You know, the subsequent year in the year 2004, we made 265 million net profit of tax. In the third year, we made another record profit, 509 million uh, net profit after tax. That year, I think we paid our debt. We took all the cash, we paid the debt. And by the time I had finished in 2005, uh, the, the company was debt free. And so the company at that time, they, we were looking at companies in Malaysia that was most profitable. At that time, when we look at the uh, the net profit as percentage of the total investment, we were second most profitable company in Malaysia at that time. So next slide. And we also set another game, the impossible. Some of you may remember there was an Athens Olympics in 2004. And I had the audacity to suggest to my team that we were going to bid and compete with every refinery in Europe and become the official supplier for green diesel at the Athens Olympics. People said I was crazy. There's no way you could do that because there are refineries in Europe. They don't have to ship their fuel, their diesel. They are all there. Unlike from us, the shipping costs is exorbitant. But I can tell you, we did win it. We became the official supplier for green diesel, uh, green uh, fuel at the, at the Athens Olympics. And because of that, we became a big name in terms of branding. The guy, the photograph that you see there, that was Gerhard Schroeder, the Chancellor of Germany, the Prime Minister equivalent in Germany. He came to launch our product as we were selling green diesel in Germany. So that's how it was. I remember when we were already in 2004, we were reaching a point of stock out. That means there were many customers that wanted our product and we didn't have enough product to sell them. And so when you have a product that is so much in demand, and people wanted the product. And when people are queuing for the product, you can command a premium for it. That's why we were making so much money in subsequent years. Next slide, please. 
and uh, I think I passed this. I'm going to move to the next one. This guy in this photograph, um, you know, the guy Hans, the, the Dutchman who made the bet with me, I asked him to give me the, the money line. I said, look, Hans, since you had a wager with me, you lost it, and that was in Christmas uh, 2003. I want you to write a letter and give me the money. So he gave me the 100 ringgit and he wrote a letter and we stuck it on the hallway. And this was on the hallway. If you go to the, the shell office in Bintulu, the 100 ringgit and the letter from Hans is still there. The guy on to, with me in the photograph is my, one of my staff. And uh, he and I were visiting Bintulu. I told the story to my commando staff. You know, uh, he wanted to take a photograph in front of it. So we took the photo and he put on his, on his tweet, and the tweet says, this story that the boss tells us about is real. Next slide. And I want to now shift gear to the second secret. So if you want to do transformational leadership and business turnaround, or you want to do achieve the best you can, you must anchor on, on true north. You know, if you are going on an expedition, the term true north is the measure of where you're going. Everything in life, if you want to succeed, you want to be the best salesman in your job. You put up a target and say you want to be the best salesman in the company. You want to be the best engineer, you will say that you want to be the best engineer. So anchoring on the, in the sketch of turnaround is to anchor on the profit and loss. So what I'm saying is that you must identify the right key performance indicators. And that is how on the basis of that, then you know what you're going to do with it. So better to make sure that the KPIs, the key performance indicators are quantifiable because it's easy then to see whether you're making progress. Next slide. And so I remember when I, when I run companies that lose money, the first thing I always do is to make sure we break down the profit and loss statement into its minor, minor parts so that we know where we're losing money. I remember when I was appointed as a CEO of Malaysia Airlines on the 1st of December, 2005, we were losing so much money. So I insisted that we, we break down the profit and loss statement for every flight. We are the only airline in the world to this day that I know that produce profit and loss statement for every flight in a year, during my time, we had 220,000 flights in a year. I insisted that for every flight, when a plane leaves Kuala Lumpur and he lands at London Heathrow, an hour or two later, I wanted to know how much money did we make on that flight or how much money did we lost on the flight. So that we know for the next flight, what we're going to do about pricing and, uh, and cost structure. And so uh, that was how we were doing it. So if you run a university, you should break the profit and loss statement of the university into program. If you run a car company, you should produce profit and loss statement by the model of the car. If I ask you a question, which of the model of cars in Proton is the most profitable? I'm sure many of you would think it is Saga and Wira. Actually, when my, my team and I, when we're assisting Proton, to do their uh, segmented profit and loss statement, is Zora was the most profitable. And they didn't know that too. And so when you knew that, in the case of London, uh, my story in mass was when we were flying to London, we lost something like 40 million ringgit a year flying to London. When we broke down our profit and loss statement by flight, we used to have four flights going to London, MH1 and two, every day for the whole year, we found they were profitable. Unfortunately, MH03 and 04 were unprofitable every day for the whole year. So the losses that we were incurring on MH3 and 4 were so big that it wiped out the profits that we were making on MH1 and 2. So the solution really was to get rid of MH3 and 4. It didn't mean the London route was bad, the route was good. It's just the two flights were no good because the arrival time the time that they arrived in London and also they departed London because they're controlled by slot time at Heathrow Airport. And that is why it's very important to be able to diagnose it. 
So if you are, uh, I give a simple lemon example. Imagine you are a student, you want to be the number one student in class. You cannot be the number one student in class until you understand the marks for all your subjects. So if you do 90% marks for mathematics, but you are failing for science or physics, then obviously you have to focus on physics to make sure that the, the marks is going to go up. And so in the same way, if you are a salesman in the office, you're doing sales. If your sales is so little and you cannot be the best salesman in the company, so what is it you have to do? My, my father used to say a very simple trick. He said, if you want to be the best at what you do, you must know currently who is the best. You must be kiasu. I mean, in my club language, the word kiasu is katui. Katui means burning desire to win. So if you want to be the best salesman or the best engineer, you need to know who is currently the best. And you want to know which area are they doing best and why are they doing best and better than you? And how are you going to close the gap and do better than them? And so the same way as I talk about, about companies, I also say that the principle that I described, anchoring on true north is relevant to every employee in whatever you do, whether it's going to be an engineer, you're a marketer, whether you're a salesman or you're a doctor, it's all to do with it. Next slide, please. And this is the story about Malaysia Airlines on the first page of the New Straits Times when I became the Malaysia Airlines CEO. In my photograph, you could see I looked a lot younger at the time. There was a joke going on around on my first day. People said that MAS stood for Mati Anak Sarawak. They all said that this guy is an L, is an it's, a, it's, it's an oil company man. He spent 23 years at Shell. He's never worked in aviation. He's never going to make it. So in my first town hall session, I announced to everybody, the game was impossible, that we were going to make a profit. And so uh, people didn't believe it because you know we had only three and a half months of cash. And if we didn't change the way in which we did it, and we would not be able to pay salaries to staff in three and a half months. We don't have money for fuel too. So next slide, please. And so we did the p &L that I described to 110,000 profit and loss statement. And so, and so many of them were unprofitable. Next slide. My first year was the year 2006. We nearly broke even but we didn't actually make money. A lot of people criticized me and said Idris made money in Malaysia Alliance because he sold building. To be frank with you, we sold our building and we booked the profit from selling the building in the year 2006. We didn't sell any asset in 2007, no asset sale in 2008 and 2009 and 2010. Why did I sell the building? I sold our headquarters 130 million ringgit because our cash burn rate per month at that time was 200 million ringgit. That means every month we were burning 200 million ringgit. So when we sold our building for 130 million ringgit, that is just giving us around about 20 days of cash. So I really wanted to have a lifeline. One of the things I told the prime minister Tun Abdullah Badawi, at that time when he introduced me, he said, I don't want any bailout. If you look through the pages of the uh, history, you will find that the day uh, was appointed, uh, Tun Abdullah Badawi announced that we will not bail out Malaysia Airlines. They were not going to give us any money for cash. So I had no choice. I had to find a way to raise enough cash to run operation. In the year, second year, we made record profit. To this day, that's the highest profit in the 60-year history of Malaysia Alliance, 840. In the year 2008, we had a global financial crisis. Many alliance lost money, we still were profitable. Even in the worst of time in 2010, when oil price had actually reached $100 a barrel. The jet fuels, $100 a barrel. 
and more than 95% of all the airlines in the world lost money, but we were still profitable. You can see the next slide, I think you'll show. Uh, these are some of the airlines. At that time, I was appointed on the board of IATA. IATA is the, uh, the club, if you like, for all the airlines in the world. There were 30 of us CEOs who were voted as governors on the board of uh, IATA, and I was one of them. And so we look at the data transparently. Delta Airlines lost six billion, six point three nine billion US dollars. Northwest Airlines lost four point one billion. KLM and Air France lost money. Ryanair lost money. Jet, Japan Airlines, Korean Air, everybody lost money. But we were still profitable. Malaysia Airlines, we still were profitable. Singapore Airlines lost. Uh, uh, still made money as well, and so did Southwest. I think less than 5% of the airlines were profitable. And I'm glad that even in the worst of times, we were still profitable because we were focusing on the, on the profit and loss statement, anchored on it. Next slide, please. I want to shift gear now to the third secret. The secret here is about discipline and action. Anyone that's a good employee or a good manager cannot be good and cannot be excellent in what they do unless they have discipline and they have action. People who only think and think and think and don't act, they will never ex excel in life. And people who say they are going to do it, but they postpone it, procrastinate. That's also another disease disease of excellence. So it's very important to have discipline. I always tell people, if you want to do something, you better lay out all the actions you intend to take, step by step and how you're going to do it. After you lay it out, which is called the plan, you must do it relentlessly. Really do it, they call it the D. The M is, after you've done it, you must monitor the outcome. Is it making progress, yes or no? I would suggest, at the very least, you have to monitor progress on a weekly basis. And use a traffic light, possible. Red means you haven't done it. Green means you've done it. Yellow means you've only partially done it. So when you look at those that are yellow or red, then you better solve problems. Solve problems recursively. Return back to the drawing board and see why is it when you've done this and that, the outcome is still wrong. And so it's very important to go back to the drawing board and look for new solutions to tackle that. There's a little saying that I put inside the hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. I believe in the school of hard knocks. You've got to work really hard to achieve what you set out to do. So if you set up again the impossible, like Usain Bolt, Usain Bolt, and I asked him, what is it that you are dying to do when you retire? You know, he looked at me and said, when I retire, I want to have the freedom to eat whatever I choose to eat. When he was an athlete, Every food that he ate was controlled, disciplined. And the regimen for his training was completely disciplined. And so a lot of hard work. And so it's very, very important that you have to have discipline and you have to act on it. But this is called the DMS culture of implementation. Do it relentlessly, monitor it constantly and solve problems recursively. Please remember, these are very, very important components. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of what I did in, uh, in Malaysia Airlines. This was the actual uh, daily profit and loss statement. We had profit and loss statement every day. Every day we knew which, which flight was losing money. Every day we knew how much cash do we had in our account. That was the BlackBerry. The thing doesn't exist today. Next slide, please. And uh, I want to now shift here to the next secret. It's called secret number four, 
situational leadership. Some of you who are very interested to know more about this, if you uh, Google and put Ken Blanchard, you will find a lot of elaboration on situational leadership. It was his idea and he talked a lot about this. I really like the approach. According to Ken Blanchard, he says, when you are the leader to set up a new journey on transformation, when you gather the troops around with you, your leadership style need to be directive. Why? Because in the phase one, it's called the orientation phase. That means if you gather people around and you declare to them, this is again the impossible, this is what we intend to do, many people, they will get excited. The red line is about the moral line. I mean, they are very excited with the new boss. When I went to Malaysia Airlines, they said this is a new boss, they were excited. But you know, when I said we're going to do profit and loss statement on a daily basis for every flight, nobody's done it before. So the level of competency is still very low. Some people may not want to do it, but I insist it's not for debate. We'll have to do it. I know some of you may not like to do it, but I'm sorry, we will have to do it. So when I told them we had to sell the building, a lot of people are not happy with that because they said, I bought my house in Ampang, you know, you have to sell the building in Kuala Lumpur. We have to shift to our office in Subang and I, my house is far away. I can hear you, but at the end of the day, we have to make a call because we needed cash to run operation. So directive style, not too much democracy. The second part of the journey is that the team becomes dissatisfied. It's called the dissatisfaction phase. When you are turning around the company, you're transforming a company, you're going to turn things rather upside down. You're going to break the status quo. The status quo must change. There is no breakthrough without breakdown. You have to break down the status quo. For example, if people are doing manual transaction for sales, if you tell them no more manual transaction is everything is done digitally, there are people who cannot handle that. They're going to dislike it. So when you say you're going to reduce manpower, when I was in Malaysia Alliance, I said that we were overstaffed. We had to reduce our staff by 3,000 people. Many people didn't like that. They were dissatisfied. But my style is still directive. The reason why I cannot keep on hearing people and hear the opinion about that is because if we do it, we're never going to execute the manpower reduction. The only thing I did was to make sure that people do not become so dissatisfied that they go on strike. So I make sure that nobody went on strike. I told them that we would make sure that we don't make anybody forcibly redundant. Nobody will be forced to be redundant. I want volunteers. So we created what is called the mutual separation scheme that people want to go and they put up their hands, they sign a piece of paper they want to go. And if that person is someone we don't really need and we will let that person go and we pay them some money to let them go under the redundancy program. But for those who want to go, but we need them in their work, we say, no, we need to keep you. That's why it's mutual. For those people who don't want to go, no need to put up your submission. So because of this, the staff felt it was fair. The unions also felt it was fair. So in the end, the unions, they have said, okay, we accept that you do this, the mutual separate scheme was acceptable. But you can tell you, despite all that, there's still a dissatisfaction because people are still not happy. Some people have left and the guys left behind have to do double the job. And so it's a very difficult times. The next part of the journey, the team now begin to solve the problem. They can resolve it. That's your leadership style must change. You cannot be so directive. You need to empower, start allowing people to do, to do things because the level of competency is rising. The black line, you can see on the chart, the black line is rising. They know how to do it. They solve the problem. And the moral line is rising because they're winning. So at this point, when I was there, we were making money. So everybody was happy. You know, nobody wants to be in a losing team and you start making money and everybody was like so excited. It's interesting that when we made money in those years, we were also very, our service level grew up. 
We had the best cabin crew award. We had the best business class award to, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to here. And we had uh, many, many awards that we, we, we received actually. Best economy to Asia. Uh, we're very, very happy with all that. And so the last part of the journey is that when the team is self-propelled, they're so good at what they're doing, they don't really need the boss to tell them what to do. In the case of Shell Middle Distillers, the company that I left, and uh, we have reached the level when it was so good that I basically, I was not really doing my job. They were running it. So when I passed the baton over to uh, Dick Venshoff, he was a Dutchman that replaced me, you know, they were doing far better job than my time. They did a lot more money and I always like that's the fact that when you reach a point when you are no longer relevant, somebody else can take over. I would say leadership, great leadership is people who knows about a full stop signal. They know when to let go. In the Bible and also in the Quran, Moses or Nabi Musa, he took a very directive style when he wanted to bring his people from Egypt to promised land. You know, he didn't have a GPS at the time. He just told them this direction in the desert we're going to take. They followed him. They got lost in the desert for 40 years, a very long time. They were very unhappy with him. But the moral of the story is, he was very directive in the beginning. Towards the third and the fourth stage in the journey, Moses actually handed over the baton to Joshua or Joshua. It was Joshua that led his people to promised land. That is a sign of leadership. When you can pass over the baton and someone who takes on the baton can run it and do it even bigger than you. So I always tell people, remember two things. When you start a journey on transformation, be directive in the beginning because of the team development. When the team develops to become more competent and they know what they're doing, and then you must start to empower them. Stop being directive. So that being ambidextrous is very important. And the second thing I always want to remind people is that when you reach an empowering stage when people know what you're doing, you must learn to let go. Next slide, please. I want to now talk about this guy called Mati Linsky. I, I teach at Harvard twice a year for the last five years. So two times a year, I fly to Boston and we have a program that is sponsored by Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett and also uh, a big win philanthropy. And they bring all the ministers of finance and planning, health ministers, and also education ministers all over the world. They come to Harvard and they go through a one week course. And I'm one of the faculty uh, who teach them about transformational leadership. One of the speakers there is a Harvard professor by the name of Mati Litsky. He made this comment, transformational leadership is about disappointing people at the rate they will allow you or your permit you. It means to say that you push people up to the level, they are dissatisfied with you, but they can understand the tough decisions you have to make. You are never going to transform a company if you're going to please everybody. You want people to clap hands for everything you're doing. You're never going to make tough decisions. You are never going to transform the company because you are going to do things if you want to transform it. You're going to break the status quo and there will be resistance to that change. And if you're not prepared to disappoint people, you're never going to succeed. So the trick is you will disappoint people by taking tough decisions, but you have to explain it to them so that they allow you to do it. In the case of Malaysia Airlines, when I announced 3,000 people we were going to let go, I explained to them that it is voluntary and I'm not going to make anyone forcibly redundant. Then they said, okay, we can do it. So they didn't stand in the way, they didn't go on strike. Next slide, please. This is the fifth secret. It's called winning coalition. When you are a leader, you will never succeed in leadership if you don't bring your staff 
with you. You meet, win coalition with staff, with the union, and with even competitors. There are certain things you can work together with competitors, but not to break the anti-competition laws. For example, when I was in Malaysia Airlines, and I have said to Tony, Tony Fernandez, the A is there and asked, we should, we should collaborate on safety. The safety is not a competition. We should learn how to help one another. So if we needed help from their team or vice versa in an airport, when it's to do with safety, we lend our hands to assist them and vice versa. So there are room for competition in certain areas, but not on pricing, not on getting customers. So I think winning coalition is a very, very important idea. How are you going to do it? Winning investors, talk to investors to, so that they invest in your company. So the idea of winning coalition is very important. No leader can exist unless he or she has followers. So if you want a lot of people to follow you, you have to have a winning coalition. You have to bring them. I always tell people, if you are wanting people to come with, along with you on a journey, you must tell them, why are you going on the journey? What is on the journey? What is it for them? How are they going to benefit from it? So when they see what's in it for them, then they're going to come along with you. So this is important. Next slide, please. And uh, in my younger years, I was posted as the managing director for Shell in Sri Lanka. It was a very, very difficult job. I think it's the most difficult job that I've ever had in my corporate life. And uh, the government ran the company for 20 years because Shell Gas Lanka Limited, and they lost money, I think, for 10 year, 20 years. Shell bought the company lock, stock, and barrel, and we took in 51% shares, and the government owned 49 and for five years, the company lost money. I was posted as the managing director to turn it around. It was a very, very difficult job. That is the, the sphere, the round thing that you see there is called the sphere, that LPG, the cooking gas LPG sphere. One of them had 1,800 metric tons of gas. There are four of them. Once Saturday morning, we found a live bomb underneath the sphere. And so we, we had to handle this kind of situation. If the bomb had detonated underneath the sphere, all of that LPG would have exploded. The technical terms for that would have been a blivy. That explosion would have killed everybody who lived within four kilometer radius from the sphere. And all the villagers, people would have died. So I was really frightened. It was a very hard job. We had strike. There were people on strike. There were, you know, I had to go and there was one call from our plant manager. He said, Suren Galagude, he asked me to come rescue him. 200 of our staff had surrounded him in the depot. And they were drunk and they, they said they wanted to kill him. And so he called me, come and rescue me. And I had to go with one truckload of soldiers and one truckload of police to rescue my transport manager, Soren Galagura. And you know, there is no manual in Shell that tells you how to do this. And so I had a really hard time. I think in my first year, I nearly gave up. But you know, we, by the end of the year, we, we broke even. In the second year, we made money. In the third year, we made record profit. So the company was very profitable, but we, we had to work with all our LPG dealers and all our agents. I had to win their collaboration with them. So it, it cannot just be with my staff because we don't distribute LPG. It's the dealers that do it. So I had to bring them along with me to come along and say, this is how we intend to do it. This is the new way in which we do pricing. This is structure. This is distribution channel. We have to demarcate it that this dealer will go and cover this territory. Another dealer, many of them are not happy because we were doing demarcation of all that. But I had to find a way to explain to them this is a new way in which we were doing it. And so it's tough, but this is the toughest job and I'm very pleased that uh, I survived it. Next slide, please. Uh, after that, actually, the interesting thing was I got a call from our big boss in, in London, Shell. 
he called me when I was in Sri Lanka. I said, Idris, I want you to come uh, to work in, in, in Shell in London. I am giving you a promotion. It's a big job. You will be the first Asian to do this job. You will be the vice president for retail. And that basically all the petrol station in the whole world. And I was in charge at the time. And so uh, it was fantastic. And I turned up there. But I realized that the thing that was very important was we had to work with dealers. He realized that one of the things I did very well in Sri Lanka was I worked with dealers. All petrol station, 99% of all shell stations are run by independent dealers or retailers. Shell maybe own some of the sites, but we lease the sites to the dealers. They have to operate it. So the boss said, since you know how to do it in Sri Lanka, I wanted to come and, and manage it for retail international. So it was a very nice job. I really enjoyed my time in, Sri Lanka, in, in London. I spent four years there and I traveled the world and I could go to as, as many countries in the world, at least 100 countries where we had petrol station and I could travel them. I was in Budapest, I was in Athens, and I was in, in, in Argentina and in many, many places. Fantastic role. Next slide, please. This is the last secret. It's called divine intervention. They don't teach this, by the way, at Harvard. Eh? They do not teach this. In fact, I spent one year as a fellow, a visiting fellow at Oxford Blavenic School of Government at Oxford University. And uh, I shared this to them. And the, the dean at the time, uh, you know, Nyeri, he said, it is, you, you really teach this? Yeah, yeah, you know, they don't teach it as well. The reason why I say that is this. There are two experiential human paradigms. The first one is human beings have limited control over what happens to them. If you don't believe me, take a piece of paper tonight, write down the 10 big things that happen in your life on this piece of paper and ask one question for each one of them. Did this thing happen exactly like this? because you cause it to happen. Yes or no? If you cause it to happen to behave, be exactly like, put an X. If not, put an X and count them. On my sheet, more than 60% of the things on my sheet have net little to do with me. Frankly speaking, I didn't apply for the job in Sri Lanka. I also didn't apply for the job to go to, uh, to London. I didn't apply to go to mass either. So many things happen, not because I wanted it. All my life, I actually wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to go do law. I studied hard at school. I was a top student and I got scholarship and I wanted to go to New Zealand. Unfortunately, when the offer letter came for me to go and do law in New Zealand, because uh, I told them when you send me the offer letter and the scholarship, don't send it to Barrio where I live because there's no PO box. Send it to my auntie. Unfortunately, she was holidaying in Europe. So I didn't know I had the offer letter. So I didn't know I had the scholarship. I didn't know I had the offer letter. By the time the letter reached me, I was already in USM in Penang. And so uh, I had despaired because all my life I wanted to do law and I didn't do it because you know by an act of accident, you might call it. You know, that's one of the best things that happened to me. Because when I went to Penang to USM, I found my wife there. So you don't control many things. COVID-19 is uncontrollable. Life is a continuous reduction of option. That's another human paradigm. When we were young, somebody asked you, what is it your ambition in life? Some of you may say, I want to be a rock star. In that same afternoon, you want to be a businessman. The same day, the next day, you might want to be a fireman. You might want to be a doctor. So everything is possible. But when you get older in life, then suddenly you realize that you're not so good in maths. If you're not so good in maths, you cannot be an engineer. You cannot be a doctor. For the life of me, I don't know what dentistry has got to do with pulling teeth, got to do with maths. But that's what it is. And the other thing is when you want to study, They'll tell you, you cannot go and choose 
five disciplines, you only choose one. If you have to do engineering, you do engineering, but you cannot do engineering, but you want to do your medicine at the same time. You cannot choose, option reduce. When you graduate, you cannot go and join four companies. You know? They tell you to do only one. Option also reduce. When you get married, also option reduce. So life is, uh, when you 60% of what happens to you is not within your control, and then so many things in your life, your options reduce, life can be very tough. Now the question that you pose to yourself is this, who is in charge of life? Some of you may say it's God, some of you may say it's fate, some of you may say it's luck, some of you may say it's feng shui. Whatever it is, this is not a religious class. I'm saying that there are certain things I believe that you can do so that these things that are outside your control can work in your favor. And that options can open before you more than you even imagine. So I have three very practical suggestions of what to do. The first one is on values and actions. All of us need to be good human beings. Do good to people. If you do evil and you do bad things, somehow or other, you'll be punished in life for it. But if you do good things to other fellow human beings, for some reason or other, good things will come to you. So that's the first thing I suggest that we do. History is littered with people who did terrible things with mankind. And they eventually got caught. And the second thing is about ethics. Ethics, I would liken this to three zones. The white zone, the black zone, and the gray zone. Let me describe what is meant. White zone means right thing to do, legal things to do, the proper things to do. The black zone is the wrong things to do, illegal, corrupt. The ones in the middle, the gray, is not exactly illegal, not exactly legal, but somewhere in the middle. It's called ethics. This is why ethics come in. The more senior you become in leadership, the more you realize you have to tackle many ethical issues. And it's the only thing that happens to you in making decisions to handle ethics is your conscience. What's going on in your conscience? So my suggestion, practical suggestion, is never make decisions on ethical issues by yourself. Bring it to a group of people in management, for example, friends or the board, so that collectively you decide that many concerns are involved, not just one concern, but many concerns. The litmus test is this. When you finish discussing what actions you're going to take on these ethical issues, you write it down on a piece of paper, all the facts of the case and the options available. And then you say, we choose option three or two for these reasons, one, two, three, four, five, six. When you finish putting the document, then the litmus test is, if this document get leaked in the media, are you okay, yes or no? If you say, I'm not okay, that means you're not prepared to face the music. That means it's a wrong ethical decision. You must be prepared to defend your action in an open forum and because you believe it's the right one. And the third secret, how to get divine intervention in your favor, is to always look at yourself in the mirror. I call it the self-renewal process. Look at yourself in the mirror and ask the question, what am I doing right in my work? What am I doing suboptimally in my work? What are the things that I need to do to change, to improve? If you don't go through this process of renewal, looking at yourself in the mirror, there is no 
self-correction. And that is why I encourage people at least one month in two weeks, go into solitude, alone by yourself in deep reflection. The word solitude is different from loneliness. Loneliness means to be alone when you don't want to be alone. Solitude means you're alone because you prefer to be alone in deep reflection, thinking about your actions and how you can correct it. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope the six secrets that I've just described, one, two, three, four, and five, and six, if you think about them, if you want to change and transform, become a better manager, become a better employee, you think about the secrets I've described, setting impossible targets. Be clear about your true north measurement of success. Discipline of action. Situational leadership. Winning coalition. And divine intervention. Pulling all this together, I believe, not just one. You must do all of them together. It's like when you take antibiotics, you must finish the course. It is true, I would say that it's true that many of our present is colored by our past. But every single one of us can choose the colors of our future. Thank you.